Hi everyone, my name is Nate and you are watching WASD20. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the latest D&D 5th edition release, Keys from the Golden Vault. This is an anthology of standalone heist-themed adventures for D&D. Now I do want to note this is not a full review. I have not read the whole thing yet, but I have been spending a good amount of time with it and I just thought we could open it up together and flip through and I'll share my impressions based on what I've seen so far. Let's do it. All right, here we have it, Keys from the Golden Vault. On the cover here, we have got a nice high scene, some thieves kind of sneaking through the roof of this observatory, a closet waiting for them below. Not the most beautiful cover, but I do appreciate a good action scene in, uh, on a D&D book cover. So as it notes on the back here, the Golden Vault is a secretive organization. Operatives seek to perpetrate dangerous heists Adventurers can also complete their heist with the Golden Vault as their patron. These missions require careful planning and flawless execution, and the rewards are well worth the risk. So these are 13 short, standalone Dungeons & Dragons adventures designed for characters from 1 to 11. Um, you can place them in any setting, it says here. And I do think that there are some missions here that would fit well really well, like slotted into a campaign, more so than your typical like dungeon crawl, because I think heist missions are sometimes a little bit harder to come up with on your own. And that is one thing I'll say about this book is I kind of wish they did give some kind of advice for creating your own heist missions. That's something that I've, I, I wish a lot of these adventures had. Same with Candlekeep Mysteries. Like, why don't you tell us, give us sort of a template for uh, how to create our own mysteries a little bit more. That's something I would appreciate, but they, they never really seem to do that. Just run the stuff we make, all right, guys? Anyway, uh, the introduction here does have um, some kind of basic structure of the heists, some advice for running the adventures. It talks in here about encouraging your players to think of their characters as longtime associates, perhaps relatives, so they feel tight-knit from the start. So I do like that idea of like, hey, we've done some things together. We know each other. I think that can lead to a lot of fun in game if you can kind of like come up with these maybe like secret inside jokes that your characters would have had for a long time and also probably more importantly, you know, secret hand signals and, and sounds and things like that that can aid you in the heist. Uh, you can kind of pretend that, oh yeah, we've, we've done this before. You could obviously string these together into a campaign as well, although I don't know if I really enjoy that. Personally, when I'm playing a campaign, I like to have a lot of variety. So yes, give me a dungeon crawl here, an about town session here, and then maybe a heist there, and we're, we're all good. But when it's all heists, eh, maybe I'm a little less interested. So yeah, the Golden Vault is quite a benevolent organization, very virtuous, even though they are often performing tasks that are illegal. So they must be very secretive, but the goals are always for the greater good and things like that. So they're, they're stealing something to protect the town from this threat or things like that. You can get a little sense of some of the missions here and you notice, yeah, there's 13 of them, but there's not level one through 13. Like there's two level five missions, two level eight missions. Now, how they get the title, the keys from the Golden Vault are that operatives of the Golden Vault will deliver keys and each group will have a little box that that key unlocks. The box is actually a music box, so when you get your key, you use it to unlock your music box, and it will open, it will play a message that assigns them a heist, provides basic details, and sets them on the right path, and after the message plays, the box closes and the key vanishes. So there you have it, kind of an interesting little magical solution to how do we get our missions? Now there is a handler here that you could use. It would have been nice probably to have a, a few more options for handlers, but there are some other NPCs in here that I think you probably could use. The heist complications, first off, we got the moving MacGuffin, which is just like, hey, you thought the thing was in this room, but actually it's not because you got there too quickly and I wanna make things harder for you. And that's something I think a lot of us experienced DMs just do naturally. Like we don't need to be told to do that yet. I do feel that's really helpful advice for newer dungeon masters just a little reminder about like, hey, don't feel like you need to follow this word for word, make it your own a little bit and make it more fun for your players. Also some information here on rival crews, which are another potential uh, complication you can throw in there just for a little extra fun or to make things uh, a little more difficult. You've also got rival crew motivations and actually some 
some sample um, crew members for that rival crew. But the motivations here are specific to each mission. So if there's a rival crew in Heart of Ashes, Balofine, neutral evil elf archmage, hires the rivals to recover the Heart of Jeros, a focus item that the archmage needs to fuel her journey to become a lich. So you could see kind of signs of the rival crew that could kind of concern the players, or you could actually run into them and maybe it uh, involves some negotiation or a fight or a chase or who knows what. But yeah, pretty brief intro and then we get right into the first adventure. So, you know, I do think it might've been nice to have a little bit more on elements of a heist and what makes a good heist and kind of the tone and feel of heists. And again, maybe even stuff on creating your own heists, but it's a really brief intro. And then we get right into the first adventure, which is a first level adventure called the Merkmire Malevolence. Now I've glanced through the book quite a bit, but this is the only one I've read from start to finish. Other than that, I've just kind of skimmed and flipped through it. So I want to be totally transparent about that. This is not a full review, just again, a flip through with my impressions. But I did really like what I saw in this mission. Um, yeah, it, it just sounds fun. It sounds like a lot of fun. Now, one of the things I'll say about heist missions, and I have d played in heist missions before, and I actually have run heist missions before too, although I'm not sure I would have called them that in the moment. They were just parts of campaigns that you know had a lot of heist elements. Uh, I've really enjoyed them. I think that there are games that are better suited to heists specifically. For example, Blades in the Dark is one you might wanna look into if you're kind of into fantasy organized crime and all that. A uh, really cool game, but I do think that heist missions can work really well in D&D 5e, and I've had a lot of fun with them personally. A lot of planning can go into heist missions, and that's one thing I'll say if you're planning to run heist missions. We've probably all been in groups before where we deliberate a little too long, and it's just like you just got to do something. I have definitely been there. I have been the cause of that stalling progress before. And I have been a dungeon master when players spend just a little too long strategizing and it's like, come on guys, just do something. It's going to work out. So yeah, that happens. And that's just something to be aware of that you might want to, uh, you know, occasionally figure out ways to nudge your players or speed things along, maybe cause something to happen that forces their hand and forces them to make a decision, etc. But again, that said, I really do enjoy the heist missions I've been a part of in the past. Lovely art. I do like a lot of the art in this book, especially the, the first page of each adventure has a nice full page spread and they're really nice looking. One other thing you'll notice is there are these maps. So this one right here has a player's map. And then if we flip over here, there's the DM's map. Let's show another example here. Ooh, love that piece right there. So cool looking. The player's maps are often really fun and kind of like torn up and stuff like that. Here's a player's map. And then we got the DM's map here, which has a lot more detail, like the full floor plans. Let me just try to find another one here. Yeah, here's an example. I love this. Uh, the, the big question marks, like, I don't know what's here. <laughs> and then uh, you get to the Dungeon Master version and we know exactly what's there, of course. This one right here, you know, all torn up and missing big chunks. And then you get the uh, Dungeon Master version right here. Uh, the book has a lot of boxed text, which I also really appreciate. For me, it's just a, a quicker way to get to some of the basic information rather than having to read a huge paragraph and then try to decide what am I gonna tell players about this location. Also some nice, you know, bold headings and throughout there are bullet points, things that I feel like they're getting slightly better at in terms of um, communicating information to the Dungeon Master at a glance. There are still lots of big blocks of text and in general, for a D&D 5th edition adventure, you're not gonna be able to just kind of run it on the fly and skimming as you go. You really do need to read it all ahead of time, which I think is not necessarily true of all games, but with D&D 5e adventures, you just gotta do it. Love this piece right here, so cool looking. Now in terms of creatures, you notice that there are some stat blocks that are embedded in each adventure. They're actually at the end of each adventure you would find any stat blocks from creatures that are not going to be found in the monster manual or some of the other books. So yeah, stuff like this right here. Very nice to have that. And I appreciate that they put that with each adventure rather than just in an appendix at the back. Um, it's nice to have it at the back of each adventure instead. I also noticed that for some of the NPCs, they have little quotes and things so that if you encounter this NPC, there are actually some lines that that individual NPC might say. If you ask them this, what might they say? 
So, do you want to be set free? As flattered as I am that you care, I'm afraid I must decline. I'm fine where I am, thanks. So yeah, nice to have, you know, just some of those basics right there, as opposed to having to read a big block of text and kind of suss it out and figure out what should I tell the players? Another lovely piece of art there. So yeah, overall, we've got 13 short adventures. It weighs in at about 200 pages, just a little over 200 pages. And I like what I see here based on my initial impressions and just kind of a cursor, cursory flip through and a little bit of reading. I'm liking what I see. There have been several of these anthologies and I appreciate that they put these out because personally, I find it a lot more appealing and just a lot more likely that I will be able to fit in a nice little one-shot adventure rather than trying to bite into an entire huge campaign, which I have done before. But when I finished Icewind Dale about, you know, eight, nine months ago now, I realized like, I think I'm good on that for a while. I don't really want to run another one of these big old books for quite a while. Anthologies full of one shots, therefore, much more useful to me. Now, in terms of anthologies of single serve adventures, I would say this one is probably my second favorite of the ones they've released so far. Second only to Tales from the Yawning Portal, which is my favorite because it's just a collection of such well-loved classic D&D adventures from previous editions that were remade for 5th edition. There's also, of course, Ghosts of Salt Marsh, which are very watery-themed adventures. Candlekeep Mysteries, which are mystery adventures that are kind of, I think, centered around uh, the Candlekeep Library, if I'm not mistaken. And then there is Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel, which have kind of a multicultural fantasy focus. So yeah, Tales from the Yawning Portal is my favoritist, but uh, definitely I think Keys from the Golden Vault looks cool just because heist-themed adventures. I don't know. I, I just love the idea and it looks really good based on what I've seen so far. But I would love to hear from you as well, especially if you have run some of these adventures. That's a really important perspective, so listen to those people. And if you have, I'd love to hear you down in the comments below. I'll put links to these books as well as some other D&D products down in the video description and those are affiliate links. So buying through those does help support these videos at no extra cost to you. Another way you can support the channel is by becoming a patron. For as little as $2 a month, you can join with these amazing people in support of my work and you get access to some pretty cool rewards as well. Now I do wanna note that the weekly live map drawing streams just for patrons are currently on hold and I'm hoping they will be making a comeback sometime in the next month or two. But there still are some other pretty cool rewards. I do patron exclusive updates and little behind the scenes videos here and there. So check it out over at patreon.com slash WASD20. This time I do wanna give a special shout out to new patron Kyle Conger for coming on board. Thank you so much, Kyle. It was great hanging out with you the other day. And thank you all so much for watching this video. Take care, you'll see me again very soon.